Spread the fire fam, welcome back to SMWX. If you're new around here, my name is Dr. Sizwe Mbofu Walsh and on this channel, the Sizwe Mbofu Walsh Experience, SMWX, we explore South African politics through interviews and analysis. My, my, my. Uh, ever since uh, I did the video about this book and released this book uh, about two weeks ago, this channel has been, uh, has been on, on Smash. Uh, you've all been watching the book launches and the book events. Uh, do check those out. Uh, explore this channel. There are over 120 videos, I think, now about South African politics. And in recent videos, I've really been diving deep into this book. But I just wanted to say, firstly, thank you so much for the support you've shown for this work. It's been truly overwhelming. Uh, this book is effectively the number one book in South Africa, or has been over the last two weeks, certainly in, in its genre. Uh, it's really hard for a serious book like this to even break even, but this book has been outselling works, uh, you know, like self-help books and cookery books and Africana murder mysteries. Um, so when you start competing with those works, you know you're selling well. And I appreciate that. I think it's testament to the community we've built on this channel, which is a lot more powerful than I even realized. But also I think the content of the book. And I, I've realized that this has now gone beyond my own personal influence. And I've realized how profoundly the question of apartheid really figures in South Africa and in South African life and, and how much it affects all of us. And so when a book takes the concept of apartheid seriously and brings it back into the public conversation where it's all too often suppressed and where we prefer to keep it out of sight and out of mind, something important happens. And so thank you very much for helping me to take this work to a broader and a wider audience and for making it not only a work that I'm proud of, but one that is now having a, a profound reach. Having said that, I'd like to just delve a bit deeper into this book because I realize that not everyone can afford to buy the book and I can't afford to give everyone the book either. But I know that many of you access the ideas of the book through this channel and many of you have said that you've enjoyed the videos that I've made about the book. And so I really don't mind, you know, about taking ideas that are already in the book and giving these to you for free because you'll always be able to find something more in the book itself. But I think this is also a way of reaching a, a bigger audience with with the ideas as well. And so I think of these videos as, as like an appendix to the book. And what I wanted to talk to you today about is the chapter in this book, which is on punishment. And this chapter is after the introduction, chapter five of this book. But it's a chapter that's been getting a lot of attention it, you never know when you write which chapter will attract people's interest. And it seems that this chapter is attracting interest. And so I wanted to break it down for you, dive into it and explore the argument that I'm making. Now, before I do that, for those of you um, who aren't aware about this project in depth, um, I did a video on it, but I wanna give you a summary of what this book is about. The new apartheid is really about the following idea. Apartheid did not die, it was privatized. So even though we destroyed apartheid as a state ideology in 1994, even though the government no longer pursues apartheid policies explicitly, even though the state is no longer necessarily the key venue from which apartheid uh, affects and afflicts South African society, in the private realm of our lives, in private spaces and private spheres, apartheid continues to hold sway, hold social sway, hold political sway, hold economic sway. And in many ways, those areas of our lives are more intimate and affect us more directly than, than just in the public sphere. 
The book also shows how monumental the project of apartheid is and was. And it really shows that in the late 1980s, apartheid's planners, its economists, its politicians, its ideologues, its theoreticians, set about implanting apartheid so deeply in the South African economy and South African life that even if there was a democracy to follow, which they suspected there would be because of the international pressure on the apartheid government, certain apartheid patterns would be able to persist even into a democracy and they would be impossible to uproot. In fact, there's a quote that I opened the book with, which I want to read for you because this quote haunts me and it's just so it's so salient in other words it means so much in this current moment um, it rings so true three decades after 1994 so listen to this this is a quote from a book by henry kenny in 1980 it's a it's a history it's a historical survey of, of apartheid henry kenny is a, is a historian and he's, he says, and I quote, Dr. Nico Smith, a Dutch reformed clergyman, quoted Hendrik Verwoet, Hendrik Verwoet, apartheid prime minister, often known as the ar architect of apartheid, as saying that he wanted to implant the concept of apartheid, this is Verwoet, so deeply into society that no future government would be able to undo what had been done. This is the scale of the, uh, of the project that we're talking about. This is the scale of apartheid as a project. The idea was to implant apartheid so deeply, spatially, psychologically, in terms of economic patterns of ownership, in terms of legal access, in terms of the way we punish people, the idea was to implant it so deeply that even if there was a democratic government, it would be impossible to undo what had been done. And so when we think about the negotiations in the 1990s, yes, sure, the ANC on the one hand was thinking, if we can create a democracy, then we will be able to give power to a wide base of people. And that wide base of people through their political power will be able to turn the tide on economic forces, turn the tide on apartheid, and we will liberate South Africa from apartheid by the political route. But what we often forget is that apartheid's negotiators and its economic planners and its capital base was thinking, we are prepared to concede a democracy where everyone over the age of 18 votes because even if there is a democracy, it will be impossible for the transfer of political power to have an impact, not just on the economic sphere, but on the entire private sphere of life. So that's the, the founding argument of the book. And then what I tried to do is in the different chapters, I look at different spheres of South African life, space, law, wealth, technology, punishment. So in this video, I wanna get into the punishment chapter. Now this chapter takes a look at the way we punish people criminally in South Africa. And criminal punishment in South Africa is different often to the way it works in other places, particularly, for example, the United States, where we've seen a big debate over questions of the prison industrial complex. Now, two things about South Africa distinguish it from the United States. The first is that our crime rates and our violent crime rates are much higher than even those in the United States, which are actually quite high as well, comparatively to global averages. But we have a particular violent crime problem that, that outdoes even some of the most violent places in the world. And even by some measures, South Africa is considered a war zone. And in fact, deaths due to violent crimes, for example, just to look at one dimension of violent crime, 
often outdo actual war zones. So we have a serious problem of violent crime and that can't be denied. The other distinguishing factor is that in the United States, the prison industrial complex is largely in the hands of private players, or at least there's a great deal, there's a great extent to which criminal punishment through the prison system has been privatized. Whereas in South Africa, our correctional services and our correctional facilities are still largely in public hands. However, despite these two differences, a lot of the analysis that has already been made in the context of the United States can also actually be made in the context of South Africa. And that's partly what I show in this chapter, is that we also have a prison industrial complex. And we are also disproportionately punishing poor, petty crime, criminals. So we are disproportionately punishing those who commit petty offences who are unable to access legal services and who are unable to access even basic amounts for bail. We are punishing them with passionate intensity. Even as our society shows impunity towards those who actually do commit violent crimes who are prosecuted at very low rates, below 5% often. We also have a society which shows impunity towards politicians who effectively do the real looting from the public. And we also show impunity towards apartheid, evils, crimes and criminals. So we have a society which punishes harshly comes down like a like a ton of bricks on those who commit the least offenses drug related offenses petty crimes of theft which often re related to basic acts of survival and we don't punish those who really commit violent crimes those who commit gender-based atrocities those who commit major acts of corruption, and those who perpetrated apartheid evils. So we have a system of mass punishment for the marginalized and the impoverished, and a system of impunity for the powerful. And this is in stark contrast to the so-called constitutional miracle to which we are in South Africa supposed to be heir. Now, when we look deeper into this chapter, I also show that despite the fact that the prison complex or the correctional facilities in South Africa are still in public hands, what we have seen is an increased privatization of these prisons and of the correctional services system from within and the key example of that is Bosasa, now African Global Operations also known as one of the donors of Cyril Ramaphosa. Now what is fascinating about Bosasa is not just how corrupt they were in giving money to particularly ANC politicians who, who you know used the money for whatever purposes they did remember Bosasa came into the game through prisons so providing food in prisons providing contracts uh, to to the prison system so in fact the system of punishment which was actually being controlled by the ANC government was also a system of corruption which is which is just i mean just think about that like the system that's supposed to punish the corrupt is itself corrupt you know how can we build a society it's actually it's actually you know almost verging on funny how can we build a society that uproots corruption when the system that's supposed to punish corruption is actually feeding corruption so what Bosasa tells us, 
and we know that they fund ANC campaigns and they probably fund other, who knows, other political parties too, they probably burrowed into the entire political system, is that the system of prisons has become in some ways enmeshed or incorporated or integrated into some of these corrupt economic networks. And in that way, it's become privatized. So it's become privatized in that even though it looks like a public system, when you really go into who's doing the work of, of providing the services that that system needs to run, you'll see that it's actually often private institutions and companies and that those companies also have links to those who hold political power. So where do we find ourselves three decades into our so-called miracle? We find ourselves with a system of criminal punishment, which is incarcerating black men at higher rates now than it was in 1994, when blackness was actually criminalized through various apartheid statutes. And not just that, the numbers in our carceral system the numbers of people that we are incarcerating, the vast majority of whom have committed minor offenses. And remember that. I'm not saying we should be easy on people who have, who have perpetrated serious crimes. But we're not, we're not doing anything about that. We are using the vulnerable in this prison system often as a symbol for punishment when we really don't actually punish those who perpetrate the most serious crimes against our society. Crimes of gender-based violence, crimes of murder, crimes of political corruption, crimes of apartheid, crimes against humanity. So do we have a society based on impunity, which punishes the vulnerable with passionate intensity. In many ways, that's where we find ourselves in the new apartheid. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, comment down below with your thoughts, your questions. Of course, in a video of this length, I can't get into some of the nuances of my argument, some of the qualifications that I make. But I hope that you will, if you can afford it, buy this book. If not, I will keep making as much content as I can so you can get an understanding of this argument. On social media, please use the hashtag, hashtag the new apartheid. Tag me on Twitter, I'll retweet you. And keep returning to this channel, keep sharing this channel with your friends. Slowly but surely, this is becoming an important place to discuss politics for, in the comments, for young South Africans, South Africans of of all ages and generations. In fact, I would say the comment section of this channel is often sometimes better than the opinion section of, of a South African newspaper. And it just goes to show what a, what a smart audience I have. So looking forward to your comments, your criticisms, what you liked, what you didn't like, your best parts of this video, and let's continue to spread the fire. Aye.